this morning. We're going to be in John chapter number 8. John chapter number 8. And uh, we're going to read verses 1 through verse number 11. And I'm going to start out with a, a little bit of an illustration of a picture that some of you probably have heard before. Uh, but it fits this passage and it fits this scripture. And it's a picture of a, a, a farmer that was down in his property gate. And he was down at the fence and he had painted a sign, uh, an advertisement, so to speak, uh, because he had some puppies. And he was nailing it onto a post on the edge of his yard. And as he was putting that last nail through the sign, uh, he, he felt someone tugging on his overalls. And he looked down and there was this little boy staring at him. And he said, Mister, I want to buy some one of your puppies. And the farmer wiped the sweat off of his forehead, took a couple deep breaths, and, and he said, Well, son, these, these puppies come from really fine parents. These puppies come from a, a gene pool that, that has been carefully put together. Son, these, these puppies are very expensive. And the boy dropped his head, and he looked disappointed. He reached into his pockets, and he put, pulled out a handful of change, turning his pocket inside out. And he said, well, sir, I've got 39 cents. Can I at least look at your puppies? And the farmer took his money, and he looked at it, and he said, sure. And he let out a huge whistle, and he yelled out, here, Dolly. And out from the doghouse ran Dolly, followed by four little balls of her. And, and the little boy pressed his face up against the fence, and he, his eyes began to, to bounce and dance with delight. And he watched the dogs make their way to the fence, and then he noticed something stirring in the doghouse, and slowly there was another little ball of fur that appeared at the door, a lot smaller, hobbling around in a very awkward manner. And the little boy said to the farmer, I want that. And the farmer knelt down by the boy's side and said, son, you don't want that puppy. That puppy will never be able to run. That puppy will never be able to fetch. He'll never be able to play with you like these other dogs will. And with that, the little boy pulled his pants legs up showed the farmer his false leg. And he looked up at the farmer and he said, You see, sir, I don't run very well myself. And I'm going to need a puppy that understands. <coughs> you know we today, as humans, we today, as people, as sinners, we need that same sort of understanding. And I praise God this morning that there is a Savior who's not handicapped like the little puppy, who's not awkward like the little puppy, but who understands us the way that little puppy would understand that little boy. He understands that we are sinners. He understands who we are. He understands what we're going through. He understands what we face. Now let's not make any bones about it. This don't mean he gives us permission to continue down that road. He's not condoning the sin and the actions of our life in any way. He is holy. He is just. He is sovereign. And he hates sin. But he knows what we are made of. Psalm 103, 14 says, For he knoweth our frame. He knoweth our frame, and he remembereth that we come from the dust of the earth. He knows the sin nature that he uh, that we brought into our lives after he created us. So how does he have this kind of information? Because we have a Savior that 
has walked where we walk. We have a Savior that has faced the trials and the temptations from Satan himself. We have a Savior that was tempted of man. And he, while he was on this earth, was 100% human, but he was still 100% God. Uh, there's a misconception that, that he was somehow protected from sin as he walked on earth, and that is false. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that Jesus could have chosen to sin, but he chose not to. He could have given in to the temptations of the world. He could have given in to all the things that we give in to on a daily or an hourly or sometimes a minutely basis in our life, but he chose righteousness. And he chose perfection. And as we, we look at this chapter, as I read this passage, I, I want you to see the picture that, that John paints here of our Savior. It is a picture of a Savior that is sympathetic toward all mankind. You see, Jesus is not pictured as someone who is soft on sin. Someone who is compassionate on the sin, but rather someone who loves sinners. <clears throat> and in our time of desolation, in our time of separation, Jesus is a, is a sympathetic Savior that is reaching His hand out to us this morning, extending us His grace, His forgiveness, and His love. That is all we ever need. The sympathetic Savior. Verse number 1, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple. And all the people came unto him, and he sat down and he taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that we should be stoned, that she should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down, and with his finger he wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. And when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and he wrote on the ground, and they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? And she said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we do thank you for the day. I thank you for everything that you've given us. God, we thank you for the protection, the provisions throughout this week. We thank you for, for this church house that you've given us to come into and to worship you this morning. But God, I thank you that this church house is not the church. That God, when you died on the cross of Calvary, when you said it is finished, when the veil was rent from top to bottom, before you ascended, you left the Holy Spirit and you set up our bodies. Those that have trusted Christ as your Savior to be the temple. So God, I, I thank you for the church and every person that makes up your church. And I just pray that you will allow us to come together to fellowship with each other today. That you know, God will just put everything that, that is on our mind that is outside of this passage and this scripture and you speaking to us into the, into the back burner of our thoughts so that we can focus on you for the next few minutes. God, allow us to see the sympathetic Savior. Allow us to understand more clearly how much you love us and just exactly how much you take care of us. God, may we, may we be set free today. If there's any here that don't know you as their Savior, I pray that you convict them uh, with the message of salvation, that they can know that they can receive you today, and that you will provide that salvation that you've already paid for. But God, maybe some of us today are, are living with a burden of guilt. Maybe we're, we're living with a, a struggle that we're holding on to. And we just need to give it over to you. God, you can give freedom there as well. 
lead guide and direct us. I ask that you place a hedge of protection around our ministries. Be with our children's workers, our junior church workers, as they're studying your word in those classes. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. So we've got this passage. we got Jesus. He's come back into the temple. And, and, and the men and, and the scribes and the, the, the Pharisees, they have brought this woman before him that they caught in the very act of adultery. They, they've essentially thrown her into the floor, and, and now they're questioning Jesus, saying the, the, the law that Moses gave us, the law of the Old Testament says that we should stone her. What do you say? The first thing I want us to, to take out of this passage is, it is the fact that we do have a sinful woman that is before us. We have a person uh, that has been engaged in the act of sin, that is caught up in the act of sin, and that sin has come to light. According to the, to the narrative of, of this passage, she was caught in the act of adultery. She was guilty before the face of the Lord, and she had been found guilty before the face of the world and before the face of all people. Uh, now we know that adultery is, is definitely a, it is a vile sin. Uh, adultery is a, is a sin that is not even really commonly accepted in today's standards, and as accepting as the world is. It's something that is still looked down on. But we have to remember that James that chapter number 2 and verse number 10 reminds us that sin is sin. That, that it, we're not just talking today as we study this passage about the sin of adultery. Uh, unfortunately, that is a sin that runs rampant, but sin is sin. So I, I ask you as we look at this today that we remove the fact that she was an adulterous woman, but we see the fact that there was a sinner that was thrown at the feet of Jesus. And uh, uh, Romans 3.10 Reminds us where we are. We were born with the sin nature. The Bible tells us that as it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Galatians 3 and 22, But the scripture hath concluded all under sin. That the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Before we go any further in this passage, I want you to see that woman. I want you to see Jesus, the scribes and the Pharisees, see her on the floor. But I want you to take yourself and place yourself on the floor. Why? Because we're all sinners. Because we all struggle. Because we all have come short of the glory of of God. Proverbs 28 and verse number 13 says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whosoever confesseth and forsaketh them shall have the mercy. And, and let's, just, let's just get the elephant in the room out. Christians today are, are often accused, and I'm afraid it's all too often appropriately accused of not dealing with our sins. We want to look at the people around us. We want to point fingers at others that are struggling, others that have faults, and others that have failures. But we fail to deal with our sin. And that's exactly what, what some of the men in that group were doing. It's no different than us today. But we're guilty. We're just as this woman was. And the, and the problem with most Christians today, and the problem with a lot of churches today, it is the fact that we simply won't admit we're struggling with sin. And we simply won't admit that, that we've got it harder in our life and we think that we can cover it. We think that we can hide it. We think that we can keep it out of the sight of the people. But we forget. We can't hide it from God. So there she is. They brought her to Jesus. And she's most likely lying there in a shameful state. This is speculation. But she was caught in the very act. And we don't have any young children in here. Do you think they give her time to get dressed? Do you think they give her time to become modest to drag her through the streets? Or do you think they, they took her up and they knew what the law said and they're going to get judgment because they're going to condemn and this is going to be the end and we throw her at the feet of Jesus. 
She was probably most certainly humiliated by the public accusation. Her sin had been disclosed openly. Well, if we're harboring sin today, it's a shameful, shameful thing. The Bible tells us, be sure that your sins will find you out. And I don't know about you, I think I can speak for everybody in here. There's been times that my sin has been brought forward. It's not a joyous moment. It's quite embarrassing. It's hurtful. Luke 12, 3 tells us, Therefore whatsoever he has spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light. And that which he has spoken to be here in the closet shall eventually be proclaimed from the housetops. You can't hide it. So there she is, just like us. A sinner. Separated from God. In a shameful shameful state. Revelation 20 reminds us that there's coming a day that there'll be full disclosure of our sin. There's coming a day when that final judgment is going to take place. So again, before we go any further in this passage, the challenge is what is it that we need to deal with this morning? What is it that we've been hiding from our spouses or our children or our family? What is it we've been hiding from our co-workers, from our church, from our community? You might have got away with it up until this point with humans, but God knows about it. And you can't hide it. And you can't run from it. You can't cover it up. Only He can forgive it, forget it, and bury it in the depths of the sea. But there's coming a day that there will be full disclosure of all sin on the face of this earth. It's best to take care of it now. It's best to take care of it while we have a chance. We see her sin, we see her shame, and then we, we, we hear of her sentence. The accusers were absolutely correct. They had, they had appropriately uh, brought the, the law before Jesus. According to the law, she deserved to die. But there was a problem here. And if you go to Leviticus and you go to Deuteronomy, in the 20th chapter of Leviticus, 10th verse, Deuteronomy 22, 22, you will see that the problem was if she was caught in the act of adultery, where was the man? Where was the other party? that they would have surely known was guilty as well. And the purpose of the sermon this morning is, is not really to, to identify the law and what the law says in the Old Testament. But it is to it is to highlight that there were two people that were supposed to be put to death for this sin. But they had only brought one. Kind of makes you wonder if the man had been a part of the attack on Jesus. Maybe the man, and this is maybe speculation again, no biblical background, let's get our brains thinking. Maybe the man was part of that group that said, We got Jesus, and we can just catch a woman in adultery. We can take her, and we can, we can throw her. I'll volunteer for you to find her guilty. Maybe it was. One of the men standing there. Maybe they turned their back and allowed him to slip away. Maybe he was a prominent man and they didn't want to embarrass him. And they knew that she wouldn't have a ton of chance to talk because the law said she would die and they would put her to death and that'd be the end of it. The fact is, nobody gets away with this. Jesus knew who that man was. Christians were not going to get away with it. It's real easy for us to get together and begin to talk about other people or begin to point our finger 
that those in the church, those outside the church, those in the world, those in the community, to accuse them, to find fault in them, but fail to take care of our fault, first and foremost. Romans 6.23 tells us for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Ezekiel 18.4 says, Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. And that is God who has that possession. There's coming a payday that sin will have to be paid for. The only hope that we have is to run to Jesus. The only hope that we have is to find ourselves humbled and fallen at the feet of Jesus, at the foot of that cross, that he spread his arms and he took the nails and he took the crown and he, he took the, the spear. To be at the place that he shed his blood, it's the only hope that any one of us has in the world. He is the only way. He is the way. He is the truth. And he is the life. And no man can go into the Father except by Him. You see these men, these scribes and these Pharisees in their efforts to humiliate this woman, in their effort to discredit the Lord, they brought her to the best place possible that day. And it wasn't just the temple. They brought her to the presence of Jesus. You understand that? They brought her to the presence of Jesus. They brought her to the man who could deal with her past. They brought her to the man that could deal with her problems. They brought her to the very person that could make it all right. How about us? Are we thrown down at the feet of Jesus this morning? Is there some sin that we're harboring in our life? If we're at His feet, we're at the best place that we can be. Never, ever, ever think for a moment that Jesus doesn't care about you. Jesus is sinner's friend. He's a friend of publicans. He's a friend of sinners. In his day, he was known to hang out with the sinners. Luke 7, Luke 15, Luke 19, all of those different situations, they would come looking for Jesus and the testimony was, he's out with the sinner having dinner. Well, he's not here. He's out man, he's meeting with the sinner, eating, eating in their house. You see, Jesus, he really didn't care about his reputation. He cared about the soul of the sinner. And we need to apply that to our lives today. We guard our reputation. We, we guard what people think about us. Oh, we're not going to hang around that person. Really. We're not going to be caught dead speaking to that person because this is the way they're living. Well, Jesus would have. And he would have been making an impact on them and he would have been sharing with them his love and salvation. But what about us? We're scribes and Pharisees. And that's not a real positive biblical term. We should be ashamed of that. We have the sinful woman we, just like her, should be humble this morning at the sin in our lives. What is it that we can give up? What is it that we can take care of? What what bond of or what bondage can, can Jesus break the chain of this morning? How can He set us free? If you're here today, you don't know Christ as your Savior. Know that today's your day. Because he died on that cross. He was buried and he rose again. And he's made the payment for your sin available. And he understands. He's a sympathetic Savior. 
He understands who we are. He don't expect us to be perfect. But when we trust Him as our Savior, sometimes we grab a hold of sin. Sometimes we hold on to it. Sometimes we find our life muddy, bogged down. Why don't we get back where we're supposed to be? Well, it's because we got too much pride. It's because we care about our reputation. You see, Jesus says, if he uses the illustration, that my blood, my crimson red blood that I shed will wash your sin. Your black, your darkness, it'll wash it white as snow. That's why he calls us his sheep. And you know the Bible often illustrates two different animals. Pigs sheep. Now let's, let's think about them little pointers for a moment. We had some neighbors at one time when I was a young man that weren't very good neighbors, to put it that way. They had moved from the city and they didn't like the fact that the tractor started at 8.30 in the morning because they wanted to sleep until 10. And we built tents at night before the sun went down, so they didn't know what a steel coach driver sounded like. And shortly later, Hilltop Paul Farm went to existence at UT Disney Lane. And they really didn't like having a hog farm buried up against the property. I'm not condoning that. But it was pretty good. But you see, the pig, they find themselves in the mud puddle. The pig finds herself in the slop. The pig finds herself covered with dirt and mud and wetness. And the pig essentially goes, I'm home! Right where I want to be. But when that sheep tries to tiptoe through that mud and there's a little bit gets on his leg, What's that sheep do? It gets out of the mud. It goes to licking and it goes to find clean water and it goes to cleaning its fleece. The truth is, Christian, if you're if you're living in the sin today, and you're living in the mud of sin in your life, and you don't want to get out of it, you might need to return to the cross and check your salvation. Because no more than a a sheep wants to stay in the mud puddle. A truly converted child of God shouldn't want to continue down the road of sin when God points it out to them in the fall. That's where we're at. We're sinners. All of us. We're in need of help. And there's scheming critics around this wall. They have a plan. Their plan is to, to take Jesus and to put him in a position that, that, that he, if he simply let the woman go, then he would be seen easy as being on sin and not holding people accountable like the Word of God says he would do. And they could have arrested him for being in violation of the law. But if he gave up permission for the woman to be killed, he would then be accused before all of the wrong. And it would have destroyed his reputation as a friend of sinners and publicans. They felt like they had put Jesus in a position that he had no wiggle room and he had no way to get out. They had him. That was their scheme. And these religious men are no different than I'm afraid the majority of people today that claim Christianity. You see, them men that day could have cared less about that woman. They didn't really care about the sin she was involved in. They didn't care about her soul. They didn't care about her eternal destiny. The only thing they cared about was pressing their agenda and breaking down the righteousness of Christ and ruining his testimony. And things haven't changed. 
Scribes and Pharisees are still alive today and they're present within many of God's churches. We have people that attend on a regular basis across this world that have a plot for their own agenda and not what God wants them to do. They're focused on uh, what they think or what they see needs to happen. They're focused on the worldly things or the secular things and they don't care about the same things that them men should have cared about with that woman that day. They don't care about taking a stand against sin. They don't care about taking a stand for God's word. They don't care about the eternal souls of men and women that are headed to their eternal destiny of hell this morning. They only care about what they want to see accomplished what they want to be given credit for. You see, they had a problem that was up against them, and that problem was they weren't facing an ordinary man or woman like you and I. They were facing the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. They were facing Jesus Christ. And he simply refused to play by the rules. And when they tried to stump him, and when they tried to, 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 to trick him, they discovered that they had met their match. And I'll tell you, if you're in a church today, if you're listening in another country on another internet where we post this on YouTube, if you're working your personal agenda, if you don't care more about souls and standing on God's word and God's premises and standing against sin, you've met your match. You're wasting your time because God's going to take care of it. Verse 6 shows us that Jesus ignored them. They were talking to him. This was a huge matter, and he just knelt down and paid them no mind, as if they weren't even there. He had no use for their pettiness. He had no use for their lack of love for sinners. Now, the deep theological debate today is one of my favorite questions to go look at. What did Jesus write in that dirt? Well, you want me to tell you this morning? Let me tell you what Jesus wrote. I don't know. And you're not going to either. The Bible didn't tell us. But I'll tell you what we can do. We can look at the friends. We can look at the example gain a little insight, food for thought, so to speak. Maybe he began to write the Ten Commandments. After all, it was his finger that came down out of heaven and wrote them on the stone. Right? That would have solidified God's law. It's more important than man's law. And they both stand against adultery point out all the rest of the iniquity that the men were probably facing. Maybe he was referring to the prophecy in Jeremiah 17, 13. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee be ashamed, and they depart from thee shall be written in earth because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of the living waters. Maybe he began to write their names. We don't know. But he might be writing our name this morning as we picture that situation. Maybe he wrote Leviticus 20.10. And the man that committed adultery with another man's wife, even he that committed adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulterer shall surely be put to death. Maybe he saw that out to their attention. Maybe he wrote the name of all their girlfriends in the sand. Maybe he drew a circle showing that here's a starting point and you'll eventually end up right where this woman is. Maybe he started drawing arrows to point out the We don't know. But these are all things that Christ has done for me to show me where I'm wrong. Whatever the Lord wrote on the ground, it got their attention. You know, God knows how to speak to our hearts this morning just like you knew how to speak in that day. And we often say, but the Lord don't speak to us today, and we don't hear Him. Well, they didn't hear Him either. 
and that's the way back to you. God knows how to get our attention. And if He's getting your attention this morning, you've got two options. You can submit to Him, or you can continue to stand against Him. One's dangerous, and one will change your life. I suggest you submit to Him. Repent. Come to him. How much better would it be for us to come back to come to him by faith? For us to fall at his feet and do business with him than have him expose us. Because all sin will be exposed. Verses seven to nine, they were exposed. He said, You that is without sin, go ahead and pick up a stone and cast it at her. You first pick up the stone and cast it out. Jesus wasn't requiring that any of them be sinless when he made that statement. I think Jesus, and if you look at that word and you study that word, Jesus was requiring that they not be hypocritical and that they truly love him and that they truly be serving him. If Jesus required every person to be sinless and pass judgment, he would not come in condoning the, the law and man to be carried it out. Because none of us would ever be able to carry that out. But Jesus knew their heart. We spoke last Sunday night of, of, of who died and let us judge. Because the world will say, you're not my judge, and you're not this, and you're not that. But God died, Jesus died, and left us judge when it concerns people within the church. And we are to police each other, and we are to assist each other with the right spirit. A spirit free of criticism, but a spirit of compassion, and a spirit of restoration. That's what Jesus is referring to here. Them men didn't want to see her change. They wanted to see her put to death so they could blame Jesus. Adultery can be committed with the head, with the heart, with the thought process. It don't have to be the physical body. And at this point, the shouting stopped and all that could be heard was the sound of their rocks hitting the ground. Not thrown at the ground, dropped. Because they have begun to be exposed. Now let's give them men some credit before we move to our last point. When Jesus exposed them for who they really were, they stopped. They quit fighting again. They quit condemning those that they were out to kill. They walked away. One of the hardest things that we can do, one of the hardest things that we can face ourselves today is the reality of who we really are. The inside man that nobody knows but God himself. The sinner that struggle. The hardest thing that we can face is to say we have a problem. And that problem is sin. God, I've got a problem. I've not been focusing on you first and foremost. God, I've allowed finances or I've allowed politics or I've allowed family or I've allowed school or I've allowed all these many avenues that we have today to infiltrate my life and it is taken away from the stand that you have called me to stand on. God, I've got a problem. That is the toughest thing for us to deal with this morning. Wrapped up in pornography, wrapped up in drugs, wrapped up in alcohol, wrapped up in, in, in tobacco, wrapped up in whatever the problem is that God has showed us is wrong, the toughest thing that we can do is to face ourselves and say we've got a problem. But when God shows that to us, we need to act like these men. We need to drop it. We need to understand that we are sinful 
and that we can do something about it. Why? Because we have a sympathetic Savior. I think about Paul that wrote the Damascus. All the things he'd done to harm the church and stand against the church, God confronted him. And God exposed him. And Paul became converted that day. He changed. How about us this morning? Yeah, we're a sinner. We're thrown at the feet of Jesus. But I'm sure we can probably all attest that there's a time that we stood in the crowd with the sinners and the publicans. And God exposed us there too. Are you going to continue to fight against it? Are you going to continue to go down that road? Or are you willing to give it up? Jesus is the only one that can deal with man's problem of sin. And that he desires to do this morning. He's a sympathetic Savior. In verses 9 to 11, the Bible says he stood up and he faced her. You know, Jesus didn't give them the time of day that the last person had walked off. He remained humble below. It's kind of a picture of that woman laying on the floor, maybe. And Jesus said, these men are not going to stand over you alone. I'm going to kneel down and get between you. And when all of them are gone, I'll stand up and face you. You see, he really is an intercessor, you know. He really does desire to make intercession for us. And when that brass rock hit the floor, he stood before her. The only one, the only one that was ever qualified to take that stone and cast it, stood before her. With her standing before him in guilt. She was facing the ultimate judge that day. She had reached a point in her life where it was just her and Jesus Christ. If you've got sin in your life today, today may be that day where you reach the point. But right now, even though there's many in this room, Jesus may be speaking to you personally. It may be you and Jesus this day. It's always going to come down to us standing before Jesus, giving accountability for our sin. And we can know that Jesus has given us every opportunity to come to Him. But what have we done? We'll either receive Him or we'll reject Him. We paved the way for eternity. stood before her and he forgave her. He forgave her. The only one qualified to cast that stone and put her to death said in verse 11, neither do I condemn you. Go. Go and sin no more. The religious men that condemned this woman they had considered her, they had written her off as being nothing but good for dead. Jesus, however, saw someone worthy of his love, and he saw someone worthy of salvation. When she came to Jesus, she received two of the greatest blessings that any person would ever receive. So here we are again. We pictured ourselves as a sinner, we pictured ourselves standing before Jesus. We pictured ourselves being confronted with our sin, and we've got to decide what we're going to do with it this morning. But maybe we've been in that group of publicans and Pharisees, and we were the ones doing the condemnation. Hey, we've got some people that we live with that I think the way Paul put it, they're a thorn in the flesh. They're trouble. I'll just say it like it is. They've ruined their life. 
There's people on the face of this earth that are essentially worthless to us, but not to Jesus. Everybody has hope. Everybody is worthy of God's love. Everybody is worthy of having their lives salvaged and to find their worth in Jesus Christ. But are we going to stand like them men and condemn? Or are we going to look past it? And understand that we serve a sympathetic Savior and only He can make that impact on their lives. Show them His love. Tell them His message. Live a life before them that makes them want to be a part of Christianity. That's our responsibility. You see, she received a new Lord that day. The Lord of this world had taken a sidestep, and the God of the universe had infiltrated her life. That can happen this morning if you don't know Christ as your Savior. Through faith and by His grace, through the shed blood of Jesus, who is saved today. And once you've received a new Lord, you've received a new life. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. That drug addicted, alcoholic, can become, can become a sober, coherent servant for the kingdom of God. That adulterous man or that adulterous woman that has, has no loyalty to mankind can become loyal to God become a great servant for God. You, me, we have a hope. Jesus specializes us in taking wasted, ruined lives and saving them by His grace and restoring them to usefulness. And that's what He wants to do this morning. In conclusion, as Miss Margie comes, Maybe like this woman that we've seen in our text today, our life has just been wrecked, mocked and ruined by sin. Maybe we've been hurt by the religious crowd, the Pharisees, the scribes. Do we need to find the compassion and sympathy of the Savior? The only one that can make a difference in our lives. The only one that can make everything right. <coughs> he can deliver us from our bondage today. Jesus can set us free. He invites you to come to him today. He invites us to take any issue that he might have pointed out in our lives and to settle at his feet. Bring them to the foot of Calvary. Bring them to the Savior and allow Him to take care of them forever. Will you simply surrender your life to Christ this morning? Every aspect of it. So that we can understand how sympathetic of the Savior we serve. God loves us. God loves us. God loves us. Each and every one of us, God loves us. You are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy because God loves us. You have hope. You have hope because God, the sympathetic Savior, is our pleasure. Dear Heavenly Father, God, thank you for showing us how much you love us. God, when we find ourselves cast down at your feet, may we understand, Lord, that as long as we have breath to live on this earth, you died for us. You desire to see us saved, delivered, and set free. 
God, may we just take the, the sin that we've allowed to be a part of our life, may we cast it before you. May we just ask you to forgive us, to cleanse us. May we not continue to stand against you. May we focus on you first and foremost. May we serve you exactly as you called us to serve you. May we not be found as hypocrites any longer, but may we be found as truly searching our soul and surrendering our life to you, living for you under the pretense of your word and your commandments and your precepts. God, if there be anyone here this morning that you've convicted their heart that they've never trusted you as their Savior, that they've never received your gift of salvation, God, just allow them to, to understand today that they're headed for an eternity in hell. But you paid the price that they don't have to go there. And if they'll confess with their mouth and believe with their heart that God raised them from the dead, the Bible says, Thou shalt be saved. And it is your will for us to come to know you as Savior today. God, I pray that you don't let them rest. I pray that you, you don't allow any person or anything or any thought to hinder them from coming to you this very moment and doing business with you. God, if you put anything else in our heart, just allow us to use the altars during this time of commitment. Allow us to search our soul and to walk out of here a changed man, woman, boy, or girl so that we can serve you better. May we share the love of 